Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen. I'm the Program Manager for the Recycling Market Center and will serve as your moderator today. The focus of today's webinar topic is the evolution of wastewater treatment plant to a food waste energy facility for the cogeneration of heat and energy. Our presenter today is Tom Darby, who I'll introduce in a moment. Following his presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the Q&A feature box located on your control panel on your screen. You may also use the chat feature to request assistance if you're experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that an edited version of the webinar will be made available for viewing via YouTube links on the National Recycling Coalition and Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center websites. Also note that Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center, its affiliates and funders, and the National Recycling Coalition assume no liability resulting from the use of any information provided during this webinar. The webinar is only provided as an informational tool and no discrimination is intended and no endorsement by these organizations is implied. And now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Tom Darby is the manager of Hermitage Municipal Authority and he's a superintendent of the Water Pollution Control Department in the city of Hermitage, Pennsylvania. Tom is a graduate of Youngstown College of Business and attended Penn State University. His previous work experience includes Northwest Engineering, and he's currently offering consulting services for the food waste to energy industry. So at this point, I'm gonna turn the program over to Tom. Are you there, Tom? Hello, Tom. Hang on a second. We have a, a little bit of a technical difficulty here. Okay. Okay, we will ask Tom for a second. We're, we're hopefully we'll get him back here for for the presentation. So please hold on. Hello. Hey, Tom. Hey, sorry. Okay, you're back. Okay, you, you ready? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna, I just paused it here. I'll, we'll, we're going to start up again. Okay. Okay, how do I resume share? Okay, everybody, we're back, I believe. Tom, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, you're, you're good to go now. Yes. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, so what I'm, I'm going to speak to you about is uh, our wastewater plant here in Hermitage, Pennsylvania. Um, we uh, made a decision a number of years ago to uh, uh, upgrade our, our wastewater treatment system, uh, our, our plant, and uh, in addition to uh, uh, improving the facilities and upgrading from a Class B biosolid, we wanted to go to a Class A biosolid. But also on top of that, we decided that we wanted to be able to increase our methane production and uh, take advantage of the uh, extra uh, methane that we hoped we would produce and uh, use that for making electricity. So uh, it, on your screen, you should be seeing uh, several pictures on the first slide. Uh, that yellow uh, engine is our 600 kVA Caterpillar engine, which has been running uh, pretty much 24-7, uh, aside from maintenance, uh, since uh, it went into operation in 2014. Um, Wayne, if you want to go to the next slide, that should be fine. 
Okay, so as it says, the Hermitage Municipal Authority, uh, of which I am the manager of and have been since 1985, um, owns and operate, or excuse me, owns all of the facilities in the city of Hermitage. That's the wastewater treatment plant, the pump stations, all the collection lines, the interceptors, the manholes, and of course the the uh, wastewater treatment plant as well. So it was their decision, um, backed by the uh, city commissioners, um, who eventually pay the bill. It's a lease back uh, municipal authority which means that the authority borrows the money through a bond issue and then the uh, the city through the revenues uh, produced by the the operation of the system uh, and the customers then uh, uh, pays the uh, the lease payments and pays back the bond issue the uh, the city uh, uh, is about 17,000 people in population it's not a large city our western boundary um, if you see in the map that's shown uh, fronts or uh, uh, goes along the uh, state line with Ohio so everything to the left of the line the vertical line is Ohio um, that outline that's shown on there would be Mercer County Hermitage is down in the southwest corner they're just uh, we we pretty much abut interstate 80 on our south side the communities shown uh, are the ones that are uh, served at the moment for wastewater service Obviously, the City of Hermitage, Clarkboro, Jefferson Township, uh, Shenango Township, South Pima, Tuning Township, and Wheatland Borough. Uh, next uh, slide. So this is an aerial view just kind of uh, showing our uh, uh, treatment facilities. The three domed structures are our uh, mesophilic digesters. Um, the two at the, uh, the bottom portion there to the left are our existing anaerobic digesters that we converted, uh, rehabbed, and uh, uh, converted over to mesophilic digesters with fabric domes uh, to contain the gas. And the, uh, the, the other one, the taller one, is uh, our new uh, mesophilic digester uh, that we added in the upgrade of the project. Um, a little bit further to the top of the page that you can barely see the top of the cylinder is our thermophilic digester and that's what helps us get a class A biosolid. The, uh, uh, the process there is that we're heating the, the solids to uh, about 137 to 140 degrees in temperature. Uh, the other two cylinders then are our feed sequence cylinders. So everything pretty much to the left side of that pavement coming in off the road is our uh, biosolids handling. Um, our uh, food waste uh, uh, depackaging portion of the project or of the, the system is on the right hand side under the long rust colored uh, building and that's where we uh, take in the fruits and vegetables and dog food and, and anything imaginable that's organic. In the photograph with me is uh, Pennsylvania uh, Secretary of DEP um, who came out in June of last year uh, for a tour of the facility. Uh, next, next slide, Wayne. Okay, here's another view just to give you a little bit of a, a feel for, for our location and how we're laid out. The road running on the left side um, is uh, uh, Route uh, I believe it's 760 is the number, it's Broadway Road, and it comes right off of Interstate 80. We're probably less than a half mile off of Interstate 80. So we have very good access to both Interstate 80, uh, Cleveland to our left, Pittsburgh to our south are, are about equal distance, and then uh, the city of Erie to the north um, at the end of, uh, at the top end of Interstate 79. So we're kind of central on the western side of the state. Um, if you're looking at the overall photograph of the plant, again, the, the large orange roof structure is our food uh, treatment facility or treatment building where we break it down. Uh, the, uh, the biosolids are right below that. Uh, going to the right, to the far right, uh, you see three tanks. Those are our sequential batch reactors. And then across the driveway and further to the bottom of the page are our headworks where we uh, have fine screen removal, and then the uh, pump station that pumps the flow up to the SBRs. 
The next to the left of that is a small orange uh, pavilion. It's open on all sides. You can't really tell there, but that's where our ultraviolet light disinfection takes place uh, before the uh, the water from the SBRs is discharged into the Shenango Lake, which is in the very top left corner. You can just see a, a small piece of it. That's where we discharge, um, and the water then flows down the Shenango to uh, Beaver, and then on into the Ohio River. Uh, next slide, Wayne. So the plant itself is rated at 7.7 uh, million gallons per day. Uh, I think our last uh, report, uh, EDMR, we showed 3.6, which is uh, about our average at the moment. Uh, we do have screening and grit removal, as I said. We operate sequential batch reactors. Uh, we have ultraviolet light disinfection, anaerobic digestion. We do receive uh, liquid waste in the form of septage, DAF, liquid organics. Uh, the liquid organics has ranged from uh, tanker loads of uh, um, beer, wine, pop, um, fruit juice, um, and uh, dairy products. So uh, there's a wide range of those products. Uh, we do food waste depacking, um, and the, the um, uh, emacerated, for lack of a better uh, term, product is then sent to the hydrolysis tank uh, where we begin heating it and uh, prepare it. We really don't do much preparation there other than um, adding other uh, uh, liquid organics. Uh, from there goes the feed sequence tank, um, which then uh, feeds the thermophilic uh, digester, uh, and then into the three mesophilic digesters. Next slide. So we do produce a Class A exceptional value biosolids. Uh, I think we're one of the few in the state of Pennsylvania that do that. Um, approximately 10 uh, tons per day. Uh, it's agriculturally uh, applied. Um, we uh, utilize gravity belt thickeners. Uh, and then uh, press with a belt filter press, and we do not do any further drying. Uh, we don't uh, uh, have a very uh, dry sludge. I believe we're only about 15%, um, but again, our costs uh, uh, to have it removed are not that great. So we're saving a tremendous amount over what we did when we, uh, we were producing a Class B biosolid. We were shipping it all to a landfill, and our monthly... Uh, Disposal costs were uh, between eight and ten thousand dollars a month. Um, now we're uh, less than uh, I would say less than two thousand uh, dollars, and probably even less than fifteen thousand dollars. Or excuse me, two thousand dollars and fifteen hundred dollars a month for disposal. Next uh, slide, and that just shows uh, that's just a picture of the the biosolids in a roll-off. Next is the same thing. Go to the next one. And that should be the food waste operations uh, slide, and it shows uh, the, uh, uh, I call it a perforator. Uh, this was what uh, we started with when we got into this uh, system. And I'll, I'll make a comment here. One of the things that we, we found out as we began uh, uh, going down this road was that there was really no one for us to call and ask how they did it, um, looking for ideas and looking for uh, uh, ways to uh, to institute a program like this. So a lot of what we did uh, may not have been the best way to do it. Um, we are constantly finding better ways to do things. We're making changes to our operation. We're modifying them, streamlining um, we thought that this piece of equipment was the only one we would need. Um, this uh, uh, piece of equipment, I believe, is a REM manufactured either uh, Utah or Idaho, I can't recall. Um, but it is strictly a perforator, and it is only uh, of use with plastic uh, containers that have liquids in them. Uh, and it, that is really all it does is perforate. So we, we take in uh, a... a a large amount, uh, uh, probably two, three, uh, 20-ton truckloads of expired uh, milk, cottage cheese, sour cream, yogurt uh, a week. 
Um, this uh, piece of equipment will perforate that. We add some water to it. Uh, the liquid goes out and goes into uh, a small pump station, which then pumps over to our hydrolysis pit. Um, so that was uh, a limiting factor for us as we began looking around. Um, and, and to be quite honest, the reason we went with this piece of equipment was uh, we have a, uh, a dairy that uh, was seven, is seven miles from us that I knew was hauling their uh, uh, dairy, waste dairy products across Ohio to Michigan for disposal, uh, at least two truckloads a week. And so I went to those folks as we were getting into the design phase, talked to them, made them uh, a proposal to take that product. They were driving basically right past our door to get on the interstate, um, asked them to give us a try. and. Uh, uh, they were agreeable, and it's become a very good working relationship with them. Uh, we are very glad to get the dairy product. It is a, uh, a great product uh, for making methane gas. Uh, the, uh, the bottom picture on that slide does show the pavilion. Uh, as it was designed, it is open um, on all four sides. Uh, although the room that the perforator is in was enclosed, uh, is enclosed um, on, uh, on the west side that you can't really tell on the lower picture, but that room was enclosed from the beginning. So next slide. This, is an, it, this just shows basically uh, some of the product that we run. Um, initially, uh, it was brought to us as they would have uh, uh, received the product back from stores when it was expired or soon to be expired. So you'll see all kinds of things there, cartons of milk, cream, orange juice, uh, half and half, uh, going up the, uh, the, the conveyor is uh, sour cream and cottage cheese. And the uh, lower picture on the left is uh, actually ice cream, one of our first um, large customers was uh, a company in uh, Columbus, Ohio, that uh, on a, uh, a shelf uh, sample in the, uh, the middle, middle mid-Atlantic, um, they had a uh, listeria positive sample. Um, uh, we got together and we offered them a way to, to uh, uh, get rid of their product. They had made a decision to empty their warehouse and, and manufacturing facility and to clean all the product off the shelves and destroy it. And uh, we were able to get that. And it uh, subsequently amounted to uh, 300 tons of ice cream. And that's what's in those buckets that you see on the, on the pallets there. Again, uh, ice cream is uh, a tremendous methane producer. So next slide, please. Tom, quick question. Does the... Yes. That's a five-gallon bucket, I, I presume? Um, those were five-gallon buckets, and, and that actually, uh, good question, that created a bit of a, a, a problem for us because the machine itself would not handle those buckets. Um, fortunately, we received that product in June, and it was about 90 degrees outside, so um, it was brought to us at, at about, I believe they told us it was at minus 11 on the trailer, so it was frozen rock solid. Uh, we were able to let it set under the pavilion for just a few days, and, and then the guys individually uh, uncapped those and poured them into the pit. So uh, part of the drawback of the, the, the uh, equipment you see there is that uh, it, would not, it cannot handle large uh, containers like that. Um, that was uh, a sort of a deciding factor for us in the next phase of what we did, though. So okay. I hope that I hope that yep. helps. Thank you. Okay, next slide. Um, this shows some of the products that we get. Um, we have been uh, called on to take emergency uh, response uh, uh, organic waste uh, when a cooler will break down in a, uh, a large uh, grocery store. Um, or, or these different uh, food clubs and things like that, um, they have to empty their coolers out when the temperature uh, goes out of range. Um, so we have literally gotten in uh, truckloads of pre-made sandwiches, meals, 
Uh, as you can see, there are hot dogs. There's actually mushrooms, uh, frozen pizzas, um, anything that you could imagine seeing in a cooler. Uh, we've taken in now. Uh, having said that, and and showing you the previous slide with just the perforator. Uh, I guess I almost need a slide in there showing that we migrated also to a solid food depackager. Um, so the food you're seeing on this page would not have ran through that machine. Um, this, this product, including the vegetables at the bottom, uh, the dog food are all run through a uh, solid food depackager now. Um, and I should have a slide of that coming up. Let's go to the next one, Wayne. Okay, this is, uh, so this actually shows our uh, uh, biosolids handling. So this would be our belt, gravity belt thickener uh, at the top, the top picture, the bottom left is our chute where the biosolids, the, the, the gravity belt thickener and the, uh, um, the, the uh, belt filter press are both on the second floor uh, again. Um, I'm not sure I would ever let that happen again, but it, that's the way they were placed. Uh, the solids fall down through a chute onto a scale, and the uh, the roll-off box you see there uh, is see, uh, the scales are set to, I believe it's about 1,250 pounds. When it reaches that, the the uh, bell filter press shuts down, and we roll it off, and and the biosolids then go into a, an outside roll-off. Um, the other uh, lower right picture is the belt filter press. So next next slide. Uh, the methane production, uh, again, this is, uh, this is what, what we're um, really getting excited about uh, at our facility. The, again, a picture in the lower left is the Caterpillar engine. Um, we have just placed an order for a uh, uh, 375 kVA Nissan engine, uh, and that will go in um, uh, in in laterally with uh, in parallel with the other engine, and uh, we'll be able to operate it and work on the uh, the 600 kVA. Um, the advantage um, that we liked about the Nissan engine is it will run on 100% methane, whereas the uh, the 600 kVA engine will not. It will. We're only able to run it about 70%, and, and then we need to buy the other 30% from the pipeline. Uh, our gas cleanup system is in the lower right picture, and that's uh, the brand is BioSpark, and that's done a very good job for us. Uh, we The energy that we produce um, daily, uh, well, I, I'll just give you current numbers. We are, uh, because the... Uh, the mesophilic number two, we're actually uh, have taken it out of service because we're going to be replacing the dome on that. That's one of the, the things that we've learned um, is uh, the life of these uh, domes is not um, anything really to brag about. Uh, so it's out of service. We're only utilizing two mesophilic digesters, but we're generating about 40 to 60,000 cubic feet of methane gas per day. Um, we're able to use that then in the, uh, the 600 kVA engine uh, and send that out to the, the electricity out to the uh, grid. Uh, the uh, uh, energy company, First Energy, then credits our electric bill monthly um, based on how much we've generated and, uh, and produced for them. And uh, our electric bills would normally be between $25,000 and $30,000 a month. And we're able to whittle those down to less than uh, $5,000 a month, uh, which most of that is the distribution fees that we can't get rid of on the energy. So um, we see that as a win. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a great cost reducer for a wastewater treatment plant, which is very energy intense. Let's move to the next slide. And this this slide just shows the... The thermophilic digester on the left, the two gray cylinders in the middle are the uh, feed and pre-feed sequence tanks, and the uh, the nemesis on the right. If you look in the center, you will see a flare. We're required to flare 24-7, um, and uh, if we're not producing gas, we need to buy gas to be able to do that as well. Next slide. So... Um, our system, our process, uh, 
runs in automatic mode. Um, we, uh, at the time I put this slide together, we were feeding 30,000 gallons of uh, solids per day into the digesters. 30% um, of that would normally be food waste, uh, and we can feed up to 57,000 gallons per day. Now, our, our feedings are set up for three times a day, uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, no, excuse me, 3 o'clock in the afternoon and 11 o'clock at night. Um, and those, uh, uh, we can take that system out of automatic and put it into manual and adjust the, the amount of the daily feeds as well. Uh, but we do have the capability of going up to 57,000. Let's go to the next slide. So this is just a, a, a line schematic diagram, whatever you want to call it, that shows the process. Um, starting at the top, the thickened municipal sludge from the gravity belt thickener is sent over to the pre-feed sequence tank. Um, below that is septage. We do receive a lot of septage um, that we didn't in the past because uh, it, it, uh, um, it, it does work for us and helps us out, maybe not a great deal. Um, but it is a revenue producer, and uh, it's been able to do a good job for us. Um, then below that is hauled in consumer packaged food waste, which is, is taken through a food waste shredder. That could be the perforator. It could be um, our solids depackaging equipment, which is a, um, a Scott's turbo separator. My mind went blank for a moment. Um, which separates the organics from the packaging, whether it be uh, plastic, cardboard. Uh, we've even run uh, soup cans through that, and it will separate that as well. We do not run anything that's in glass, however. Below that is hauled in liquid food waste. Um, that could be the DAF water, uh, or uh, um, we've taken in uh, sauces uh, from... Uh, spaghetti sauce manufacturers, um, drums of uh, honey that weren't, um, uh, uh, how do I want to say, they were actually uh, um, confiscated uh, by the, um, uh, again, I'm drawing a blank, by a federal agency, though, as they came into the port from China. Um, they actually had less than 5% honey in the drums. They were mostly made up of rice syrup, corn uh, uh, syrup, and some other ingredients. And uh, I believe all told we did about 2,055 gallon drums of that product. Um, and uh, it did make a tremendous amount of methane for us. In fact, we had to throttle back how much we uh, fed the digesters per day uh, because it just uh, was was too much for the system. Um, the uh, uh, the downside of that was we were not allowed to inspect the drums before we we put in a proposal for them. Um, so we took them sort of a, a pig in a poke, and what I imagined was flowing honey to come out of the 55 gallon drums had probably less than two inches of liquid honey, and the rest was crystallized, and the drums had to be split open with a uh, a saw and uh, and the drums then peeled apart like a banana to get the product out of there and into our pit. Um, but it did make a lot of energy. Um, on a bright note, we were able to recycle the drums and we got four dollars a drum. So if you think about that times two thousand drums, uh, we did pretty good on top of what we were paid to take it and uh, on the amount of energy we produced. It was. I don't know that we, uh, I don't believe we lost money on it. Let's put it that way. Um, then the bottom one is the hauled in grease and fats, which we do get from from uh, customers or clients that uh, pump restaurants uh, grease traps. So it all goes into the uh, food waste hydrolysis tank. Again, we do some heating in there, especially when it's colder. From there, it goes through the sludge screen process. Uh, actually, it doesn't go through the sludge screen process. That was more of a headache, so we eliminated that. Uh, it goes directly into the pre-feed sequence where it's mixed with uh, with a thickened municipal sludge and then fed into the digesters. 
So next slide, please. And this is pretty much the same process um, if you, as the previous slide. Um, so I won't really go into too much detail on that. We can go to the next slide. So this was sort of an explanation of how biogas could be used. Um, it uh, we considered some of these options, um, the, converting it to CNG. Um, that is not entirely out of the question yet. Uh, we currently uh, have a contract out to construct a uh, 100,000 cubic foot. Uh, containment vessel for those days when we produce a lot of gas and we, maybe our engines down, um, but we want to be able to have uh, a storage facility to to contain that uh, product and be able to use it at a later date. Um, that is also a possibility, or that would also become part of a process if we decided to go uh, and and uh, add a CNG uh, compression station. Uh, would give us a place to reserve that or store it. Um, we had considered a blending, uh, selling it back to the pipeline and not using it ourselves. Um, I believe that our gas is clean enough that, that it would be uh, uh, as good or better than the pipeline gas is now, um, although that would involve a, a, also a compression station, I believe. Uh, which I believe was estimated between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars to construct. We don't have a need for that at the moment. We're very happy doing what we're doing. If I were starting out um, new, uh, some of these other options I think would be uh, well worth considering. Uh, okay, next slide. Yes, cleanup and purification. Yeah, this is just more of what I've already talked about. We, uh, uh, the BioSpark system does remove hydrogen sulfide, moisture, and siloxanes. Um, let's see, next slide. And that I talked about a little bit. Um, these are just some, some ideas that we had for the, the CNG. Currently, uh, our city uh, of Hermitage has about 100 vehicles, counting police department, fire department, street department, and uh, uh, the wastewater treatment department. Um, none of them are uh, 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 have been converted to CNG, so it would involve uh, either beginning a purchasing program of vehicles that could run CNG and or uh, beginning a conversion conversion program um, so that the existing vehicles could do that. So that that is an expense that would need to be looked at. Other uh, options are local fleets that use CNG, shuttle buses. Uh, we have a council of government here, Mercer County, that runs the uh, shuttle bus system, and I believe some of those are already equipped to run CNG. And again, uh, property maintenance equipment could be converted. Next slide. And please remember, all, in all this that I'm talking about, um, we are first and foremost a wastewater treatment plant. Um, we do generate or we do treat uh, a, an average of uh, three and a half uh, million gallons per day. Um, we meet our NPDES permit monthly. Uh, we have no problems with metals, although we have a uh, uh, Pre, uh, pre industrial pretreatment program, and I have a full time environmental coordinator um, who uh, visits 16 uh, permitted industries that contribute flow to the uh, Hermitage wastewater treatment plant. Um, they do a very good job of pretreating, um, and our water quality is very good, um, exceptionally good. So, in addition to generating energy and powering. Um, our, our own facilities, not in a sense that we can use our energy, um, but the power that we generate from it is credited to us. Uh, we are still operating a wastewater treatment plant. Um, I added some cons on there, although I put a cons uh, page at the end. So let's go to the next slide. Again, these are just some photos. Actually, there's the honey 
uh, the green drum and the black drum. Um, we've taken olives from Italy, dog food, bags of onions. Um, we've had uh, uh, produce from South America, um, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia. Uh, the dog food is not from that far away. Um, there is a tremendous amount of organics um, that are out there um, that are being landfilled. Um, the value of them uh, can be recovered after a long-term uh, storage in a landfill. You can begin to extract the methane gas. Uh, we like the way we're doing it. We feel that uh, uh, it's a quicker process. Uh, we, have, uh, we do have uh, landfill uh, material. The packaging um, uh, still goes to the landfill. Um, but we're reducing the, the total loading by a sub significant amount. Um, I, will, uh, I will also say that when we began this, we were able to sell our HDP2 uh, plastic milk jugs. Uh, we had a market for those. Um, uh, as you're all pretty much aware, that, that market has ended. Um, until recently, we were still able to get a value out of dry, clean cardboard um, that has also gone away, um, although we're storing as many cardboard bales as we can, um, and uh, we will get rid of those as a last resort. We won't run out of space. Um, but uh, uh, if there was a process uh, or a way of uh, getting recycled value out of these, we would try and find it. So the next slide says what's next um, we would like to add a larger hydrolysis tank that's one of our limiting constraints um, our tank that was designed again uh, we we our engineers at the time did not have uh, a lot of uh, information to work from to design something like what we have here so we have a 35,000 gallon uh, hydrolysis tank uh, we can easily fill that up in half a day with material um, if uh, if we get a lot of product in. Um, and what can happen is we can get a tanker call in the afternoon with uh, uh, 6,000 gallons of, uh, of DAF water or uh, uh, wash down water from a dairy or something like that, and we'll have to... Uh, uh, put that into other tankage that we have on the site and uh, aerate it until we can get it down to the hydrolysis tank. So that I would like that to be at least 100,000 gallons of storage, if that was if I had a, a wish list. Uh, organic waste storage tanks. Uh, again, this could be uh, organic waste that that we couldn't hold. Uh, we would have a separate tank that we could bleed into the system. Number three, we've hired more employees. Uh, I feel like we're we're in pretty good shape on the employees list. Number four was team up with Veolia on an e-cruiser, and I'll have slides of that yet, but we did do that, and we're doing that now. Um, it's a great piece of equipment. Um, it does a different task of uh, uh, breaking and depackaging materials. Um, and uh, if I don't have a slide that shows that, I'll explain that a little bit further. Uh, number five, characterize food waste strengths for blending purposes. Um, part of what we, uh, we've learned is that um, it's, it, the things that make the, the uh, uh, mesophilic and the thermophilic digesters generate more gas are the same things that make humans generate gas, to put it bluntly. So it's the foods that are high in sugar, high in starch, um, the things that, uh, uh, the milk, the bread, the, the starchy products, the sugary products, those are the things that help produce methane. Um, so those are the kind of things that we try and balance when we maybe we have a lot of fruits and vegetables in. Um, uh, we'll get uh, with the romaine lettuce that, that uh, recently has had salmonella sampling, uh, we'll, uh, we don't get a lot of benefit. When you take a lettuce and, and uh, break it down, it turns to nothing but water and uh, uh, some cellulose. So we'll blend that. We'll try and blend that with some other products, some solids and things like that. 
Um, so we're not just trying to make energy out of nothing. Sixth item, convince legislators to buy in. Uh, uh, we feel like there should be uh, uh, other plants trying to do this. Um, I'm aware of a few that are, are in the planning stages. There are some private uh, facilities, I think, that are doing this uh, with uh, uh, organics on site. Um, but uh, there, are, uh, there are opportunities here to, to uh, remove items from landfills and to uh, uh, generate energy. Wastewater treatment plants don't need to just treat wastewater. Um, they can, in fact, uh, generate energy. Uh, so that's that's my whole mission. In 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 w once we got going down this road, and I saw that it was possible. Um, that's sort of my driving force in this is, is seeing other uh, industries and other operating, uh, whether they be private or municipal operations, adopt some of these ideas. And the next page, Wayne, is the uh, that is a, a photo of the e cruiser before we brought it on site. Um, this this piece of equipment will depack uh, organics um, with a lesser amount of impact, so it's not shattering hard plastics. Um, it's it is a uh, a screw press type of operation. Um, I don't have any pictures of it on this slide presentation but the screws can be operated back and forth independently in unison. Um, and the end result is a cleaner uh, waste package or waste stream, uh, which means that the organics, the, the maximum amount of organics are being pulled out and are, are being sent to the plant to make energy. The next uh, slide, uh, basically, yes, we've done 2,055 gallon barrels of honey, 300 tons of ice cream, 6,000 gallon tankers of buttermilk, uh, 2 million plus gallons of septage per year, 60 plus uh, tons of expired dairy products per week. Um, the image in the background is uh, trimmings, obviously, from fruits and vegetables uh, from a wholesaler who's prepping. Uh, grocery products for uh, a, a food or a grocery chain. And the next slide is the cons. Uh, this was, I, I put this in at the last minute because um, I, as much as I like the system that we're doing and the way we're running things, we, we are learning. And, and this is, uh, we're going into our sixth year of operation. Um, and, and, Despite these cons, I would do exactly what we did, only with some minor modifications. Uh, things we didn't know was about, which we should have known, uh, were the high pH environment. Uh, we have ductile iron valves and uh, spool pieces um, in places where the uh, food waste is eating these out. We've had to replace the, the uh, impellers in the Landia chopper pump um, with stainless steel uh, impellers and housings because they were completely worn out and, and chewed out. Uh, elbows and valves had to be replaced into the thermophilic digester. So the use of stainless steel um, would have, should have uh, had more consideration in these locations, and, and I hope that, that people will take those things into account. Uh, the need to dispose of packaging without recycling opportunities, again, um, that's a con now. It wasn't when we built it. We knew we could sell some of the plastics and some of the cardboard and get some value out of it. Um, now we can't, so that has to go back as a negative. Uh, we do get a tremendous amount of wooden pallets that we're able to sell locally. We have people stopping in all the time, but we also have people who buy them um, uh, whatever we have every month if they're not gone. Um, cardboard, again, has value, maybe, um, but uh, it, it will probably have more value or have value quicker than plastic will at this point. Uh, marketing, marketing, um, it, that's a con. We're a wastewater uh, uh, treatment plant, first and foremost. Uh, we run wastewater plants. 
we run pump stations, we clean collection systems, um, but now we're running a small business practically uh, by taking in food waste. Um, none of us had any experience with being marketers. Um, I have spoken uh, at numerous locations uh, from uh, uh, just in the United States, uh, uh, north and south, east and west, and I've been to Denmark and spoken about it. Um, but those are trade people, and it's the people who have the product that, that are looking for places to get rid of it, and so we need to tap into those markets. It does have a way of finding us. Um, we have taken product from New Jersey, um, which is at the complete opposite end of our state, um, as far away as uh, um, Indiana, West Virginia, Rochester, New York, um, Philadelphia, um, and obviously Cleveland and Pittsburgh area. Um, so there is uh, there's a lot of demand, and I think if if some of these uh, uh, sources were closer, we would have a, a, even more product coming to us um, because of uh, the quantities that they may uh, decide to send to a landfill instead of send to us. Um, methane gas opportunities um, are there, um, but you have, again, a storage vessel that needs to be designed into the beginning of the system and not added in later. Uh, the domes on the, uh, the mesophilic digesters, um, should they be solid or fabric? Um, and the gas cleanup process is something that needs, all three of those need considered. Um, the fabric uh, obviously don't have a very long uh, life um, and the solid, uh, it may be a cost uh, difference uh, when looking at these. Employees uh, remaking and retraining. Again, they're wastewater treatment plant operators. I have at least 10 licensed class uh, A operators here at our plant. Um, that's what they were certified by DEP. Um, but we have them doing running the plant and uh, the pump stations, but also uh, learning how to operate equipment uh, to depackage and macerate food and organics. Traffic and site logistics weren't necessarily uh, thought through very well. Uh, we have two unloading docks. Um, I, if I had it to do over again, I would have six docks uh, with no trucks uh, having to wait. And lastly, um, uh, this, I put this down as a, as a con. It's tours. Everybody wants to see how this works. Um, for the first few years, I was giving an average of one tour a week. Um, and that's about an hour and a half of my time walking around explaining things. I love doing it um, because I, I like what we're doing, and I think that it has uh, a lot of uh, a lot of potential for use around the, uh, the United States, if not just around the western Pennsylvania area. Um, that is um, pretty much the end of the slide. Wayne, the next one is the video. I'm not sure it would show, but it just – it shows the other solid depacking machine um, that we have, the Scott's Turbo Separator with uh, uh, jugs of strawberry syrup going through. Will that show? I believe it's showing right now. Okay. It's not very long. Let me know when it's done. Okay, that's it. Okay, so uh, any questions? Yeah, uh, great presentation, Tom. So, uh, Thank you. so we're now uh, in our Q and A uh, session. Uh, again, uh, uh, if you have a question or or a comment, please use the Q and A feature on your control panel. Uh, so we do have some questions already, mm -hmm. and um, you know, a few of these go back to your uh, 
couple, you're beginning of the slides. Um, the one question is, uh, can ice cream producers send their defective and expired product to your facilities? I think, Absolutely. I think, yeah, I think they can, yeah. <laughs> We love ice cream and we, we have gotten other, other sources of it. We have gotten some other shipments from the same facility. Um, and we take it in any type of packaging and we now have the ability to run five gallon plastic buckets. So that's, that is definitely an option. Uh, do you need to sort the sugar flavoring and additives from the dairy with, within the ice cream before processing? No. no you can just take it as is. Okay. Um, you know, going back to your, your comment on, on the containers and, and the stuff that's left over from the, uh, the packaging. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about how, you know, what what products are made and 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 marketed? You know, can can that stuff be recovered for recycling? Uh, you mentioned I think before, I think before that you're having trouble marketing some materials. The the uh, uh, the plastics. So the uh, the plastic milk jugs, uh, we were getting a value out of that, but we're now having to pay. Uh, to have that hauled to a landfill. The, the, the recycling company we're using uh, as of last summer was no longer interested in it, um, and we, they were going to be charging us to take it. So, so that has ended. Um, uh, we have tried to find some other uh, sources to get rid of it um, at less cost, um, but we've not been successful with that. Yeah, as, as you know, there's a, you know, China has uh, restricted imports of recycled materials from our country. So uh, mm -hmm. that, that closed off a lot of end use markets for, for a lot of these materials, but hopefully that will turn around uh, at some point. Well, one of the things that, that um, just recently was speaking with someone about, and I know it, it, that at the uh, uh, SWAMA uh, conference in Harrisburg in September, there was a product there that someone is using plastics, melting it down to make some kind of an erosion control base. Uh, and I haven't been able to track down the actual company that manufactures that, um, but, but that seemed like uh, it might be a way of reusing some of the stuff. I mean, other than, we can clean it pretty well. Um, so if, if the contaminants were removed from it and it was usable, um, I think it would make a great product, and, and also as a building material, I know it's it's kind of a far out there idea, but that's something that we're trying to to research a little bit. Okay. Uh, here, a couple of these have have the same question here about: uh, Do you have issues with contamination uh, getting through the into the uh, digestion system and eventually out into the uh, into the sludge? Okay, we have a small amount when we use the uh, um, the turbo separator. Uh, what we found is that uh, uh, products we were getting um, product in in the clear uh, plastics uh, uh, containers, but the lids on these would have a harder plastic uh, composition to them, and so in the process of uh, um, depackaging uh, in the uh, turbo separator, they're getting shattered. Uh, the impact and the centrifugal uh, uh, force or the way that the, the organics are removed, um, there were small pieces of plastic coming out. Uh, we've been able to remove those or eliminate that by running those types of products now through the e-cruiser um, because of its, its uh, screw press type of uh, organics removal. It doesn't do the shattering like that did. So that's why we actually have three different lines that we can run now. Um, but yes, that can be a problem. And, and, and it, I was very concerned about it until we were able to, to get the uh, uh, Veolia product on site and, and begin using it. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you can answer this question, but the uh, this attendee was curious as to sources of food waste. Is it mostly in-state versus out-of-state, industrial it's versus commercial? It's all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For the most part, our uh, organics are pre-consumer. Uh, we, we get very, very little uh, post-consumer uh, uh, organics. So we're getting product from the manufacturers, um, from the field. Uh, in fact, I had... Uh, uh, we, we received a 20-ton truckload of Idaho potatoes uh, that had been shipped across the United States. 
to uh, a grocer in Pittsburgh who rejected uh, out of seven truckloads, he rejected one, and they uh, they referred him to us. And he called and said, "I can't afford to ship these back to Idaho. Uh, what would you folks charge me to to uh, handle these solids or handle these potatoes?" And and I gave him a price, and he said they'll be there in the morning, and they were. And uh, you know, potatoes, raw potatoes, make make great energy. Sad uh, because they weren't that bad. Um, they looked like they could have been used. Um, but so we get product um, virtually from anywhere that somebody wants to get it to us. Uh, it becomes a matter of shipping costs, really. Our costs um, are, uh, we are very competitive with landfills. It, it, in my mind, it makes no sense to send it to a landfill uh, when, if you're within driving distance of us. Hope that helps. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, here's a couple specific questions on your operation. Uh, this this uh, question has to do with the, the sludge screen. Uh, can mm -hmm. you explain more why that wasn't helpful and um, is it was it location or just the technology? I think I think the location of it was not um, uh, designed well. It was. Uh, it was placed next to the hydrolysis pit, um, but its location, uh, it's, it was almost like it should have been before the uh, uh, hydrolysis pit, but it was after the hydrolysis pit before the, the feed sequence tank. Um, and I don't believe that the capacity of it was great enough to do us any value. It wasn't fast enough to remove it. Um, um, based on the, uh, the amount we were trying to feed into the sequence tanks. Um, I don't think the design of it was proper either. I don't, I don't remember the name of it, so I won't be able to tell you. Um, but it was, uh, it was a long unit. It was probably, actually we still have it sitting here in the, in the garage. I believe it's probably about 18 or 20 foot long. Um, but it just did not fit in with our, uh, our process. Okay, here's another equipment question. What size screens do you use in the depackager? Uh, good question. I can't tell you exactly. We have a multitude of screens that we can put in the turbo separator. Um, uh, I honestly, I don't want to answer that because I, I feel like I would be guessing at it. Um, and the same with the Veolia. Um, I do have uh, some videos uh, online on, uh, uh, I've posted them on my LinkedIn account, um, at different times, but if someone's interested, I can get them a list and it will, they can, in the videos, they could actually see the screens. I'm pretty sure that we're using, um, and some of the, in the, the operation of some of these pieces of equipment. Yeah, we can follow up there. We can put you two together and, and you can talk okay. shop. Yep. Um, it's actually another, uh, AD operator. So. Uh, you guys speak the same language. There you go. Great, great. <laughs> so can you get a little bit into the uh, uh, the financial aspects of this project? I mean, uh, you, I, yeah. I assume you did initial analysis, uh, uh, cost, cost estimates and so forth and studies, and then it, comparing that to actual uh, numbers, you know, what, what is your, you know, for example, what's your, your payback on, on the project? Um, so that's a very good question. One of the things that when we put the, the, uh, the, the this phase out for bid back in 2008, um, we actually pulled some of the food waste um, out of the, uh, um, uh, they were an alternate in the bid process. We pulled it out. I think it amounted to a million and a half dollars uh, of the project. We did a $32 million uh, upgrade. Um, and I believe the food waste process at that time, it, and it wouldn't include all of the work, but most of it was about 1.5 million. Um, the uh, the payback on it, um, I believe we were looking at uh, uh, seven to eight years, seven to uh, seven to nine year payback. Um, the electricity alone. Uh, so so here's how we saved. Um, and these are things we didn't think about when we went into this. Um, our revenue is generated from from uh, receiving uh, the uh, the organics. So we're we're 
charging to receive the organics to take it in and break it down and then we're we're creating energy from it that we get a savings on our electricity and that was really what we were looking at was harvesting the 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 heat um from the process being able to use the methane gas to begin heating our sludge through heat exchanger um and i guess i guess we were a little bit um uh not really thinking the process through i mean we we really hadn't considered that we were going to be making revenue taking the product um that has been um a very good um revenue stream for us so um i can tell you that we have over the last 5 years um averaged about 150 to 200,000 dollars a year in revenue and that's really without any marketing without really going out and and trying to get new uh food sources um when you add that to the amount of energy savings that we have had um because we're generating electricity that we're getting a credit on our electric bill um you can see we're approaching $300,000 or more a year uh in savings and that goes back on our our ratepayers so that our our wastewater uh department um who does the billing for the sewer customers um our uh, our monthly fees here in Hermitage we we our customers our residential customers pay a flat fee of $47.50 a month and that amount has not increased for more than 5 years um because we've been able to offset that with the income that we're receiving um from the uh, taking in the food waste the organics and then the processing of uh the solids and and creating energy from the methane gas um and there's one other component that it, it doesn't really depend on the the organic side of it but but I need to to say this is that because we went from a class B biosolid that we had to landfill every year at thousands of dollars and now creating a class A EV or EQ uh uh product um we're saving in disposal of that uh considerable amounts of money so the whole the whole operation together as a package um is how we're able to hold down our customer rates and i think that i don't know that our customers understand that um but that's that to me is a very very important thing when when everyone else is facing raising uh taxes or or revenue streams um that that are going to affect the customers um we're able to do that just through making changes to operation and and yes making investments but we're making investments that are are allowing us to generate revenue and that's not something that most wastewater plants think of doing um they provide a service um and they expect to be paid uh for their op- operation and maintenance of that um we're going a little bit further with that idea and we're trying to actually uh operate like a business but we're still under a municipal authority uh city uh government uh status um so it's kind of unique um it, but it also has its challenges okay what what are your tip fees for your material incoming material they range um uh quite honestly we look at every every uh uh type of product when we get a call if it's something that we've never uh um handled before then we look at how much uh packaging materials involved how is it packaged is it on uh, pallets is it in uh uh we take in uh, and we actually recycle uh, ivc totes uh we take the tops out of them and we give those to to repeat customers so they make they can put their product in there in bulk um and then we'll clean them and and let them take them back um we have customers who uh who bring us material in tanker loads so that charge is based on a uh, a gallon price and, and not on a weight um but just to give you an example um uh a shipment of expired product that's in cardboard boxes uh in the the cardboard boxes you may have uh bladders of uh product organic product you may have uh plastic bottles 
um, or maybe smaller boxes with food product inside of wrappers and things like that, we would typically charge uh, in the neighborhood of 30 to $35 per ton. Okay. And, and what does that compare to as far as their, your landfill fees in the Pittsburgh area? I believe the landfill fees are, are in the neighborhood of $50 a ton. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know in, in the past, uh, you know, as you move from the East Coast, New York, New Jersey, moving west towards Pittsburgh <laughs> and Ohio, the, 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 the tip fees are drastically lower than, than in the Eastern right. Coast. So a lot mm -hmm. of times you're competing against low tip fees in, in the Western PA and Ohio yeah. areas. But it, yeah, I guess, you know, from my point of view, if, as long as I'm not spending more to break it down and, and get rid of the, the uh, basically the trash, the garbage that's left over, um, as long as I'm still making money at it, we're getting a value out of the energy of it. Right, right. Um, so, and that's really, that's the driving force for us. We don't want to take it in uh, at too low of a cost uh, because we... We still want to make money on that end of it. We're doing. We're providing a service. We're actually providing a service that um, is green. Um, it's environmentally uh, conscious. Um, we uh, we we created a, a certificate of destruction at the very beginning uh, when we took in the ice cream that uh, the uh, the company that took it needed to show the the certificate to the the FDA for approval. They approved it and we've used it ever since. And every customer who ships something to us uh, with the invoice gets a copy of the certificate of destruction. If they need to show it to anybody, uh, we certify that we destroyed the organics in there in a responsible way. Okay, here's some questions on the, on the sludge itself. Uh, do you test for PFAs? No. Not yet. <laughs> right. Um, where's, where's the other one here? Oh, uh, nutrient value. Has your nutrient uh, value in your biosolids changed uh, with the introduction of the food? Um, well, I can't say that it's changed because it has been added since we upgraded. So since since our biosolids became Class A, um, we've been adding bio, uh, excuse me organics. So it's been a constant blend. Um, our last uh, um, analysis of our biosolids, and I'm not going to make any numbers up to, to make this sound like a great idea for, for biosolids, but I believe it was like 611 uh, if you were to go buy it at a uh, uh, ag center. Um, so it's not, it's not a, uh, a high nitrogen uh, uh, or or um, phosphorus or potash product either, but it's uh, it has moisture retention value to it, and it is organic, uh, as organic as it can be, I guess. So um, it has some value to it. It's not overwhelming. Okay, I think you might have touched on this before. What's uh, on average? How many tons of food waste do you take in per week? Um. Let's see. We can. It depends. There are, uh, uh, for instance, the month of October we were extremely quiet. Um, Thursday, or excuse me, th uh, November ramped up. December has been very busy. Um, I would say we're doing now in in the neighborhood of uh, uh, 100,000 tons, or excuse me, 100 tons per week. Okay, and I, I believe you mentioned you did say some something about capacity. You're you were at 30, and you had capacity of 57. Is that correct? I'm not sure what. Oh, that's what the food waste. Uh, or, well, actually, it's the uh, amount of feeding uh, gallons per day of feeding to the the digester. The digesters. Right. Right. Uh, but that is basically a mix of the wastewater biosolids right. with the organics. So yeah, we're currently actually feeding about 24,000. We normally average about twenty, or excuse me, thirty thousand when we have all three digesters, all three mesos up and running. We only have two at the moment, uh, but typically a third of what we feed is organics. Do you take in uh, biosolids or sludges from other wastewater plants? We do, uh, not a great deal. Um, we have uh, we've we've offered that service to some surrounding communities that are 
are generating a Class B biosolid that is going to landfills. Um, but for whatever reason, they uh, uh, the way they're doing it is the way they've always done it, and they're not interested. So, um, yeah, I, I would be I would happily entertain anyone else that that had an interest in that. Uh, this one asks for you know a question. They have a question on the pH. Uh, what are the issues with the pH uh, in, in your system? Well, the the uh, the thermophilic digester operates in a range of five to five and a half uh, pH, and the uh, um, so what it's basically doing is eating the the. Uh, the ductile iron piping that we have in there now, it's it's corroding it, it's eating it out. The the impellers in the uh, the Landia chopper pumps were eaten out as well as the housing on that. Um, so it's extremely uh, acidic and corrosive. Okay, I think uh, we're we're just about out of time here. So there are a couple of questions left, and uh, and we do have those questions on our on our attendee report. So. Uh, we can uh, forward them to Tom for, for some follow-up, possibly. So uh, we're going to wrap it up now. So uh, so great questions, everybody, uh, and and I really really have great uh, uh, great questions for for Tom. And, and thank you again, Tom, for for You're being welcome. our presenter. So again, this webinar, like all the webinars in this series, has been recorded and will be made available via YouTube links on both the National Recycling Coalition and Recycling Market Center websites. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you'll join us for next month's webinar. And please visit the NRC and RMC websites for schedule updates. And uh, have a great day, everybody, and have a, a great holiday season.